Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Denise. I'm also known as Hey Wig Sister on Instagram and Facebook. Today is the first video in my new wig wearer series. And the video today is all about wigs themselves. So in this new wig wearer series, I plan over the course of multiple videos to cover all of the information that you as a wig wearer should know. Uh, to help make your experience and your journey with wigs smoother and more comfortable and more successful because let's face it there is a huge learning curve when it comes to wearing wigs and it can be very overwhelming and very confusing to the new wig wearer but even if you're not new to wigs I still may share some information that could be valuable so I hope you'll stick around and maybe give me some feedback on what I'm presenting and whether or not I missed anything but if you want to know everything that there is to know about wigs themselves between the different types of hair fibers that are available and the different types of caps that are available, then stick around for this video because I'm going to cover it all. Okay, so let's talk about fibers. What types of fibers or hair are available when you are purchasing a wig? We've got um, I would say four major categories. You've got regular synthetic, heat friendly or HD synthetic, human hair, and then a human hair synthetic blend. Now there will be variations within each of these types of hair. So um, in a synthetic fiber like the one on my head, I'm wearing Jewels by Henry Margu. This is a regular synthetic. You will find some variation in, in the fibers. So you might get a Noriko synthetic wig, and those fibers tend to be a little bit thicker, a little bit sturdier. They feel a little bit kind of heavier versus this wig, Henry Margu wigs, those fibers tend to be a lot lighter fibers, a little wispier, a little... Um, like finer hair, you know, where some people might have a thicker hair shaft, that could be Noriko. Some people have a finer hair shaft, that could be Henry Margot or Gabor or Ellen Villa. So there will be some variation within the fiber, but let's just stick with the main categories of fibers and I'll kind of give you the pros and cons of each. So regular synthetic, like I have on my head. That is, uh, when you're looking at kind of ready to wear wigs, that is the predominant type of fiber that you'll find out there. All of the major designer brands carry regular synthetic with one potential exception, which I'll talk about. And so what are the pros of regular synthetic fibers? Well, a major pro in my opinion is how it holds its style. So in the case of this wig I have on my head, this is the style that she comes in. It's a, it's a loose, kind of deconstructed, curly, wavy style. If I wash her, she will dry with this same style. If I get stuck in the rain, the hair will maintain the style. Um, you will have to do a lot to this wig for this style for it to lose its curl and wave. It is possible to um, treat a wig poorly and have the style that it came in start to falter over time. But if you care properly for your wig and you don't take heat to it, then a regular synthetic wig will hold the style that it comes in, whether it's curly or straight. Now. There are some ways to take heat to a regular synthetic wig to modify. I could straighten this wig with steam, for example. That is beyond the scope of this video. Just know that everything I tell you today, there could be some exceptions, but these are the general rule of thumb when you're dealing with wigs. So with regular synthetic, they don't tend to be heat stylable, and they usually hold the style that they come in, and that's why you purchase it, because you like the style that it's in. So that's the first type of uh, fiber I'd like to, you to know about is regular synthetic. And that is, for me, one of my favorites. I would say for a brand new wig wearer, my advice is always to start out with regular synthetic. They're the um, smallest learning curve. They come almost always shake and go or at a very minimum need a little bit of like water and scrunching and hanging to get rid of box hair but very low styling ability is needed with regular synthetic the next type of fiber i'd like to talk about is heat friendly synthetic or 
HD synthetic. Uh, some of these <laughs> have a lot of different names which can add to the confusion. So you might hear people talk about HD wigs, heat friendly synthetic wigs, heat defiant wigs, all of those are referring to the same type of hair fiber. And to demonstrate, I'm going to show you Bellissima by Beltress. And when I started to talk about synthetic fibers and I said all the major name brand wig makers have a regular synthetic, Beltress is kind of the exception. For the most part, Beltress wigs are heat friendly. That's what they're known for and they really don't have a non-heat friendly line at this time. There are a few exceptions but in general when you see a manufacturer carrying Beltress they're going to be heat, fr heat friendly versus um, like a Henry Margu. I don't think they have any heat friendly wigs that I'm aware of. John Renault has a few heat friendly styles. Most of theirs are regular synthetic. So you'll have to look at the description to know whether the wig you're looking at is regular synthetic or HD or heat friendly synthetic. So what is the benefit of a heat friendly wig versus a regular synthetic? Well, first of all, you can take heat to these wigs. You can use regular heat styling tools on a heat friendly wig. So that would be a curling iron, a hot air brush, a hair dryer, a flat iron or a straightener, a crimping iron. Um, the, the, each, each one of these will have its own recommendations as far as the temperature level you should not exceed. So make sure that you look at that. But as long as your heat styling tool has a temperature uh, adjuster, then you should be fine to use it. Just don't go above the recommended heat setting that the manufacturer recommends. But I could take a curling iron and I could put curl in this wig. If I had a curly heat friendly wig, I could take a straightener and straighten it. So that is one huge benefit with heat friendly wigs is that they are more flexible than regular synthetic. Another benefit that I find with heat friendly wigs, especially bell tress, is how the fibers feel. I absolutely love the feel of bell tress fibers. I think they are spectacular. They are soft and silky and they flow beautifully. They are just something to behold. And I, I have a lot of synthetic wigs. Some of them feel amazing and I think they feel like human hair, but there is nothing that I've ever felt that compares to a bell tress straight heat friendly wig out of the box. It's just amazing. So that's a couple of great benefits to heat friendly wigs. But there are also cons and something I want you guys, I might say this more than once in this video and I really need you to take it to heart. With everything in life, there are trade-offs. Wigs are no exception. You will have to make some trade-offs when you're wearing wigs. You're going to have one thing you love and one thing you wish were different and that's going to always be the case. You may love regular synthetic for the fact that it holds its style and you can get stuck in the rain and your hair is going to still look beautiful. You're going to be on a 100 degree, 100% 100 humidity day and your curls aren't going to fall. But if you won't get too close to a hot oven and open it up, it may singe the front of your wig. That's the trade-off. So just be aware of those trade-offs and then you can make informed decisions. With Heat Friendly, the trade-off is these fibers are slightly more finicky or fragile, which is interesting because they're tough enough that you can take heat to them, but they're a bit um, harder to care for when it comes to um, showing their wear sooner. So because of the way these fibers are made, they tend to be impacted by uh, friction in a different way than regular synthetic. In a heat friendly wig, if it's long enough to rub up on your clothes, you will start to notice pretty quickly the ends starting to get frayed and frizzy because they are very sensitive to things like friction. Another thing that you'll notice with heat friendly wigs is they start to get clumpy faster than a regular synthetic. And an example I have is this this style or an, I have Lady Latte in uh, Beltress Lady Latte and 
after a number of wears, when I go to shake it, it doesn't flow like this. It flows in like one big kind of clump, a bunch of big clumps. It's not something that anybody would notice looking at you and you're not walking around flowing your hair all over the place, but it is something that you will feel and experience. Now, you can take heat to a heat-friendly wig and that will solve that problem. And I do have a Tip Tuesday video where I show how you can take a hot airbrush to deal with frizzy ends and hair that is not flowing very well. All it takes is about 10 minutes with a hot airbrush and it, it's as good as new. But you need to be aware of these things because if you're not, when you get your heat-friendly wig and it starts to act differently, you're going to be upset and you're going to think there's something wrong with your wig. I recommend new wig wearers start with regular synthetic and don't go straight to the HD unless you are super comfortable styling hair, playing with hair, you you know, you did a lot with hair prior to wearing wigs. Um, I think it might just be a bit too much in the beginning for most wig wearers. It sure was for me. Let me give you an example. I purchased, my very first purchase was a Bell Tress Top Wave Topper. It was beautiful and it had beautiful waves and for the first four wears I thought I had discovered gold or oil or something. I mean I literally thought I solved all my hair loss problems. And then about the fifth wear I couldn't get it to blend with my hair anymore. I, I couldn't understand what was going on. It did not flow right. It didn't look right. I really struggled with it. I had no idea, first of all, that it was a heat friendly wig. I didn't know what a heat friendly wig was. I didn't know anything about wigs. It was just something I bought based on a picture. Um, I also didn't know um, that you need to take heat to heat friendly wigs at some point to keep those fibers uh, looking good. And so that was really an unfortunate way to find this stuff out. My second piece of uh, sort of a con of heat friendly wigs is if you get a wavy or curly heat friendly wig, keeping the fibers nice using heat becomes a real challenge because when you take heat to that wig, you will alter the curl pattern and the wave, even potentially to the point of completely straightening it. And while you can take a curling iron to it once you do that and put curl back in, it is very unlikely that you will ever get that same curl pattern back. So something to keep in mind with heat friendly is um, I believe wavy and curly heat friendly wigs are much more challenging to care for. Now, if you like styling hair, you don't mind changing the curl pattern in your heat friendly piece, then don't be afraid and go for it. But if you are uncertain about these kinds of things, or if you buy the wig because you absolutely love the curl pattern, know that as soon as you take heat to it, you are going to alter that curl pattern. I personally stick with the straight heat friendly wigs. That's my personal preference, then I don't have to worry about any of that. But I want you to know the difference. So regular synthetic, heat friendly synthetic. Let's move on down the line. The next type of hair, which I won't spend a ton of time on, is human hair. And there are, uh, there's multiple categories of human hair within human hair. So when you purchase a human hair wig, you can purchase a Remy human hair wig, R-E-M-Y, Remy, or you can purchase a non-Remy human hair wig. Um, there are some major differences between the types of hair, and I do have a video, so in my hand right here is my Push wig, it's a Wig Studio One line called Push, and this is the Eileen. I have a couple of videos out there about this. My first one, I go into depth about why I wanted a Remy human hair wig, which this is. And so you can check that out if you're curious about human hair, or if there's enough uh, curiosity, I can do a whole video on human hair. I'm not super experienced with it though, I just need to tell you that. Or non-Remy, which this carry by John Renault is. So pros and cons of human hair. Well, first of all, it's human hair. We're all familiar with human hair. Uh, and even if you've lost all your hair, at some point you probably had hair, unless you had alopecia from a very young age. But most of us understand how to care for human hair. Most of us have at least attempted to style human hair in the past. So there is that familiarity. That's always good. Um, it, 
it feels awesome. You know, it's certainly, unless you get a bad batch of hair, it feels like human hair. I mean, you know, what are you, what are you going to say? Uh, but there are a number of cons to purchasing human hair. My biggest con is that you have to style it. It is not going to look great out of the box. You are going to have to style it. If you um, put it in a box, you it's it's not likely going to be shake and go when you go to wear it. Whereas this wig, I store her in her box. When I'm ready to wear her, I just shake her out and she's perfect. That's not the case with human hair. So you do have a time that you have to do uh, take to care for those and style human hair wigs. The price, they're, they tend to be very, very expensive. That's another uh, challenging piece. But a benefit is they last such a long time. So whereas a regular synthetic, you might get three to four months of everyday wear. That's the general accepted time frame for the life of a synthetic wig. I'll tell you though, I've had wig sisters say they don't last more than two months, and I've had wig sisters on six, seven, and eight months, and they're still going strong. Another one of those that's going to vary, but the general word on the street is synth regular synthetic will last three to four months with daily wear. A human hair wig, on the other hand, can last one to three years with daily wear, depending on how you care for it and the quality of the hair. So that's a huge difference as well, is the longevity of the pieces. But overall, human hair does have a learning curve. It does require styling. It is impacted by weather. If it rains, it's going to get all like it's going to fall just like your hair would. If it's 100 degrees at 100 percent humidity, unless your unless well, let me just put it this way. Some people, their hair might poof up in that kind of weather. It's likely the wig is going to frizz and fall. So you will have some of those challenges with a human hair wig. So again, those trade-offs. The last one I want to tell you about is a human hair synthetic blend. There aren't a lot of these out there, but there are some. So I have here Envy Lindsay. This is a human hair, heat-friendly synthetic blend. I do have a video on this on my YouTube channel if you're curious. It feels amazing. It definitely feels like human hair. It, uh, honestly, it's just, the feel is awesome. Um, it hangs a lot like human hair. And so from that perspective, if you're looking for the super realism, this would give that to you. Another thing though to consider with the blends is I guess what would be a pro is that it will hold the style longer than regular synthetic. So if you were to put curl in this wig, it's likely going to hold that style for the most part until you take heat to it again, similar to a heat friendly synthetic versus a human hair wig. Um, the price point is somewhere in between regular synthetic and human hair, so that's another pro. But, you know, a con would be that you still have to style it for the most somewhat. I would say this one acts more like a heat-friendly synthetic, in my opinion, than it does human hair. And the ends are holding up really great, which I think is kind of the benefit of, of blending in the human hair. So, But keep in mind, everybody who makes a, a blend the amount of human hair versus synthetic may vary. So your mileage may vary with that. So I don't have a ton of it. Even though I own this one, I haven't worn it a ton and I've never curled it. But um, I will say from what I've read and heard, curling a heat-friendly synthetic isn't as easy as curling a human hair wig. It takes a little bit longer for the curl and then you have to let the curl fully cool in order for it to set. But it can be done. So that kind of wraps up my section on types of hair fibers. So you really need to know what types of hair fibers are you willing to deal with and then make sure that you educate yourself on the care and maintenance of those specific hair fibers. My personal opinion, regular synthetic is a way easier place for a new wig wearer to start. It's just a lot easier to care for. Okay, so let's talk about caps. There are many different styles of wig caps that you could consider, and each one comes with pros and cons, and as we get into caps with more features, the price point also goes up. So first of all, let's get our vernacular straight. 
when people refer to cap features in a wig, you'll hear this a lot, you know, the, the cap features. That is anything in a wig that is above a basic or machine made cap. And I'm going to show you an example of every single one of these except one. I don't have one of these, but I'm going to show you an example. So cap features, lace front is a cap feature, monofilament is a cap feature, Extended nape is a cap feature. So every one of these have certain types of cap features and that's going to be really critical for you to uh, pay attention to when you're purchasing a wig because each of them is going to make the wig look a little bit different. So let's, uh, let's take a look at each of these cap features and I'll show you the differences and I'll talk about the pros and cons of each of them as well. The first thing I'd like to show you is just the basic cap. So you'll hear this referred to as a basic cap or a machine made cap. And it's only because the cap doesn't have any features. It's just a standard cap. So in a basic cap, you're not gonna have a lace front. You're not gonna have any monofilament. I'll tell you what all of those are. You'll typically have ear tabs. Some wigs don't have ear tabs, but I would say the majority of the major name brand wigs do have ear tabs. And the ear tabs usually have a little bit of a metal stay in them and sometimes have hair sewn into them like this Broadway does. And what that does is it allows for more realistic coverage at your kind of your temples and sideburn area. The metal stays allow you to sort of push and squeeze them onto your head so there's no gap and having hair sewn in will allow that to be more hidden. You will hear me in my videos talk about coverage how does the cover how is the coverage on me and that is really talking about you know can you see my bio hair on the side which henry Mart this jewels has phenomenal coverage on me i almost always show my bio hair here but jewels is doing such a good job of covering where the ear tabs fall on you will impact how um the coverage but also how comfortable glasses are if you wear glasses so um, all of the wigs will have generally have the ear tab and then there's the nape some will have an extended nape if I have one out that has an extended nape I'll show you and that also is is a comfort feature it can help with coverage at the nape especially in a shorter wig um, if you have a low hairline in the back it can help um, keep the wig from feeling like it's riding up as much if that's an issue you have with wigs So you'll learn whether or not you prefer extended nape or not for me. It really doesn't matter I guess I don't care either way if it has an extended nape and then all wigs will have some sort of adjusters So this one has velcro adjusters and so you've got a Velcro tab here, and then you can pull it and make it tighter. So you can adjust the circumference around your head. Some wigs have bra strap adjusters. Um, and like, uh, I'm trying to think of who might have a bra strap adjuster. I'm not a huge fan of those, I will tell you. Um, well, anyway, bra strap adjusters, and then some have hook adjusters. So those are generally the three types of adjusters. I far and above prefer Velcro adjusters. I think that they work and stay the best. But this would be considered a basic cap wig. And then the rest of the wig is wefted. So you've got wefting throughout. What is a benefit of a basic cap wig? Well, the, one of the number one benefits is price. These are going to be priced generally lower than other types of wigs because they don't have the machine they don't have the hand tied features so all of those features lace front mono top mono part they're all hand tied some human being had to tie in the hair fibers to those features whereas these are generally made by machine so there is um price is a big difference um some for some basic cap are more comfortable they sometimes find those lace features a little bit itchy that varies i don't personally have an issue with that but i have seen people say they can't wear wigs with lace fronts because it irritates their forehead um also sometimes with machine made you can get a little bit more uniformity with the style from one to the next although i don't know how how much that is really true uh, but I would just say basic cap, usually it's the price point that's the biggest benefit of a basic cap. And um, so that is a basic cap for you. The next step would be 
a lace front. So you've got mostly a basic cap, but then you have a lace front. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you Aesthetica Ocean. So Ocean has just a lace front, but one of the awesome things on this particular Ocean is how deep the lace front is. You get about two inches of lace front, which actually mimics a part line then. It's, so it almost looks like there's a mono top. Um, I should have looked to see if I had another plain lace front wig that had a really short. So sometimes the lace front will be really short. So what's the benefit of a lace front? Take a look at Jules. You cannot see that lace front there. I won't lift it up because she's adhered to me, but you can't tell that that's a wig, especially from far away. It, it looks like the hair is grown out of my head. And that is one of the benefits to a lace front is the realism, the styling abilities. I can wear her up in clips and I do often and everybody will think that's my hair. So it's a huge benefit to have a lace front. What you'll want to try to find out is how deep is that lace front? If the wig has no other features, the deeper the lace front, the more styling flexibility. On Ocean, that lace front probably goes to about here on me which means all of this looks like part. Um, actually, Jules only has a lace front and her lace front only goes to there. So here's the lace front on Jules, whereas Ocean's probably goes to there. It's at least one and a half times in size. So having a wig with just a lace front will be cheaper than a wig with a lace front and a mono part or a mono top. Ocean is cheaper than Avalon in the Aesthetica line. Avalon has a lace, uh, a mono part and a lace front. Ocean only has a lace front. So the price point is a little bit different. I love this one. I don't miss the monofilament on this at all, but some people absolutely need that mono part or mono top. So that's something you're going to have to learn for yourself. Let's move on to the next example, a lace front and a mono part. And for that, I'm gonna pull out Bellissima again by Beltress. So here you go, you've got a lace front and a mono part. So that's gonna give you the realism of the front and a part that's gonna allow you to, um, it looks like a part line on anybody's hair. So therefore, it adds to the realism. I will give you some cautions though about these. There's lots of variation in how mono parts look. So this is a, actually a pretty wide mono part. Some of them are much narrower, which gives you much less parting space and you're very limited to exactly where that mono is. If it's a, if it's a deeper or a shallower part than you prefer, you're not gonna have that styling flexibility. Another con to a mono part wig, most of them come left part. This is a left side part. It's on the left, going to the right. The 90%, 95% of the wigs with a part are on the left. So if you are a right hand parter, if you tend to have your part on the right going to the left, then you are going to feel like fish out of water with this. You're gonna put it on and it's gonna look odd to you because it parts the opposite way than you're used to. We'll talk about the next style, which will solve that. So that is one of the cons though of these. Another con that I have found, and it will vary wig to wig and line to line, is how much of that part line you can see. So in this particular wig, she still has a little bit of the zigzag part because I haven't worn her yet and I haven't reviewed her. But I will tell you that I have another Bellissima and I had to put foundation on the part line to make it stand out because the way that they, uh, the kind of uh, monofilament that they use is a little bit darker and it doesn't stand out as much. And I gotta be honest with you guys, if I'm gonna pay money for that cap feature, I wanna be able to see that part. And I do find in some wigs, it's very hard to see the part. And so you can put makeup on it. I use foundation or translucent powder. And you can also pluck the part line, pluck some hairs out to widen it if you really can't see it. So just keep that in mind though. Mono parts are great for realism, but there are challenges to them like anything. Moving on, the next in our uh, progression of cap features is a lace front and a mono top. 
So this is Envy Lindsay again, and she has a lace front and a mono top. That is a full mono top, and if it were on my head, the mono filament would probably be something like this, this whole top section. The benefit of a mono top is now you can part it anywhere you want, right side, left side, center, deep right, deep left, shallow right, whatever you want to do and you can change it up. And that is a huge benefit. It gives you a lot of styling flexibility. You can do a top knot and have a part on either side of the top knot, which would look super realistic. That is a huge benefit. A con to having a mono top is price. That is a more expensive cap feature, and so you're going to pay more for a wig with a full mono top versus just a mono part. And so that is one con. I would say another con that's pretty common is this line right here. So a lot of wigs that have a full mono top have a line between the lace front and the mono top. It's a reinforcement, actually. I think it's there to help protect that lace front a little bit um, versus on my Bellissima, and this is also pretty common, when you only have a mono part, the lace and the monofilament just kind of go into each other. You don't get that line there. Why is that a bit of a con? Well, because you can often see that line. Depending on how you wear your hair and how wide that parting space is, you can sometimes see a line right where that line is. And I see people complain about it all the time on Facebook and in the groups like just saying, I can see a line, how do I get rid of it? Well, you can use makeup, again, just use a little bit of powder or a little foundation to smudge it a little there and you can definitely do something about it but it sometimes does require some sort of an intervention like that. I would say most wigs that have a mono, full mono top have that line. I'm not sure that they all do, and some of them are thicker and darker than others. Some of them you can't really see, so it will just vary. But please keep in mind that that is, could be a con. Another, um, another con, potentially a con, is if you like wigs with a lot of volume, there's not generally any permatease on that monofilament. We're going to talk about permatease in a minute, but what that means is the top might sit a little flat for your taste, and there's not going to be anything you can do to get volume there. If Jules had a full mono top, I would not be able to get all of this volume up here and this she might have a ton of volume on the sides and then be a little flat on the top. I have seen that in some wigs before and depending on the styles that you gravitate toward and what you like, that could be a con. It could also be a, a positive, right? If you want something a little flatter, a full monofilament is really going to give that to you. So there's great benefits there. Okay, final, final um, synthetic cap that I'm going to talk about is fully hand tied. And to demonstrate a fully hand tied cap, I have Ellen Villa Tempo Deluxe. And so here is the fully hand tied cap. And what I love, and actually I think her this one actually has a little bit of wefting on the bottom. Let me grab another wig here. Because then maybe I can show you that difference too. So I also have Rachel by John Renault, which is a fully hand tied cap. And I don't think Rachel has that wefting on the bottom. It's closed wefting. It doesn't. Okay, so great. It's another exam another variance I can tell you about. So let's first take a look at a fully hand tied cap. This is Rachel. See the line I was talking about? John Renault has it as well. And so this, she's got the lace front, the full mono top, but then all of this is hand tied. Very expensive. Hand-tied wigs are quite expensive. That's the biggest con of a hand-tied is the price point. But look at the back of that wig. You can see my fingers through it. That is the very back of the head. That is one of the huge benefits of fully hand-tied. You're outside in gale force winds, you're on a boat, and you've got it adhered so the wig's not going to fly off, but the hair is blowing all around they will never know it's a wig because this is gonna make it look like it's just growing out of your head. Huge benefit of fully hand tied. Another huge benefit of fully hand tied, updos. I 
I would hazard to say if you are someone who goes to a lot of events, maybe you're in a season in life where you go to a lot of weddings or you are you go to galas and benefits where you have to dress up and your hair has to match the outfit, a hand having one hand tied cap in your arsenal of wigs is going to make a huge difference for you because you're going to be able to do any kind of updo you want and it's going to look so realistic because everywhere you pull it, it looks like it's growing out of your scalp. And because the fibers are hand tied, they move more naturally than if they're sewn into a wefted track. Those aren't going to have flexibility of movement. They have complete flexibility of movement in a wig like this. So let me take you quick to Tempo Deluxe. Because a cup, some some hand tied wigs actually have been coming out with this. So Tempo Deluxe has these on the very nape. These are closed wefts, so they're not. I like closed wefts because the hair fibers can't push through, which is nice. Um, and so, how do I know that? Because when I went to look at the back, I can see the tracks. So some manufacturers are actually putting those few wefts on the bottom. I believe. Um, Raquel Welch, uh, Editor's Pick Elite, did that as well. And the argument for it is that it prevents tangling at the nape. It helps to prevent tangling at the nape and keeps the hair at the nape laying flatter. So just keep in mind that you might get a fully hand-tied cap that has that uh, just a few closed wefts in the bottom. Okay, Final bonus, I'm going to talk about one more thing that I'm not going to spend any time on with the caps, but there is another type of cap feature that I personally have not seen in a synthetic wig, but I know it's relatively common with human hair, and my push wig has it, so I wanted to show it to you. And that is, oh, I have one more cap type. Let, let me skip this for a sec. Um, I did forget this one. Did I grab it out? I did, sorry, one more cap type, and then I'll get to that human hair one. This is a double monofilament. I forgot to talk about a double monofilament. So I have here a more Cody to demonstrate a double monofilament. This is a double. So let's just show you the single again. Where is my single monofilament? Okay, sorry about that, you guys. Single monofilament, double monofilament. Can you see? This is more kind of transparent versus this. So what are the pros to a double monofilament? Well, number one, some people find those regular monofilaments to be a little itchy. They can feel a little bit rough if you have no bio hair. I personally have not experienced that, but I have seen people talk about it. These are so smooth and silky, they will not cause itching on your scalp. The other part that's really awesome about a double mono is it is super realistic looking. That's the, that's the parting. So it takes on the color and appearance of scalp versus a single monofilament. It looks somewhat real, but it doesn't really take on the color of scalp. And if you have a wig cap underneath it, a wig grip, um, or bio hair, dark bio hair, you might be able to see that a little bit through that monofilament, which is where using foundation or makeup comes in with a double monofilament it's really realistic and it looks awesome again it's a bit more of a spendy cap feature and not very many wigs come with these they're uh, the more line by um well a more uh to have double monofilaments but not very many others do all right let me go on to that final one so this one it kind of looks like a double monofilament, but it's called a silk top. And a silk top is something that you can get in human hair wigs. And of all the tops out there, there is nothing that looks more realistic than a silk top. Look at that. It is amazing. So realistic. But like everything I've talked about today, there are some trade-offs. What are the major trade-offs with the silk top? Well, the first trade-off, if the wig has a lace front, it's really obvious where the lace front ends and the silk top begins. They're just such different material. And so you can 
Work your way around that by how you style your hair or use some makeup to disguise it. But it is something that some people are sensitive to. I personally don't think anybody's going to notice. Nobody is looking at my hairline that closely. And when you're talking with someone, you're moving, they're moving. It's not like they're staring straight at your forehead and you're standing still. So I don't think people will see it. But people are sensitive to it, so I wanted to mention it. And then the other part of it is um, the, the hair doesn't move as naturally on on that top in order for me to shift that part line I have to take heat to this I have to get it wet and I have to blow dry it and I have to work hard to redirect those knots because it's multiple layers and the hair is sewn into multiple layers so it's just a little bit less flexible I guess not even that it just takes a little bit more work but it's so super realistic so the final cap feature I don't have to show you would be a mono crown. This is also something that is not very common. I know Ellen Villa has quite a few wigs that have mono crowns. What that is, it's a small, maybe quarter sized or nickel sized piece of monofilament right at the crown. And I think the thought behind that is, is it helps that it's in, in shorter wigs especially, it helps the top of the hair lay more natural um, because of that monofilament. Uh, so anyway, that is something you might see. I can't show it to you because I don't have one with one. All right, so we got through all the different cap types. I hope this was helpful. Um, I will. I have a companion document on my website to this video that lists everything that I'm talking about today in chart format with the pros and the cons listed so that you can refer back to that anytime. You won't have to come back to this video and try to find what it was I said about a monofilament. So please go to my website and you can look at that companion companion document and that will just help you when you're online shopping and something comes up and you can't remember what Denise said about that type of a cap feature. All right, let's move on to the next section. All right, everybody, this is the final section and this is where I just want to briefly talk about hair volume and permatease and some of those other things that are, are features of wigs that you might be confused about. So again, everybody's tolerance for these things is going to be different and you, this is just something you're going to have to learn about yourself and I can almost guarantee wherever you are today, you will likely evolve to a different place. I could not wear jewels when I first started. Too short, too much hair and volume. I just would have put this on my head and thought it looked completely like a wig. Now I love it and it looks super natural to me. It's one of my husband's favorite looks and I had to grow into it though. I, I couldn't start here. So wigs are going to come with different volume um, amounts of hair and so when I do videos I try to talk about whether it's a uh, you know, heavy hair volume, light hair volume, whether it's, you know, heavy density, light density, moderate density. I try to like lift up the hair a lot so you can see. I talk about does it feel like it's thick? Does it feel like a natural density? Those are all things that are subjective. What I say feels like a natural density might be too much hair to you. So you're really going to have to just be patient with yourself and work your way through this and learn as you go. And I would keep notes of everything that you try. What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? So that in the future when you buy another wig and you're asking someone questions, you can say, well, I thought Avalon had way too much hair. What's the density of this one like compared to Avalon? Those are the things that will help you go a long way in your journey. So you do need to do a little bit of work on your part too. And I would say every wig you purchase, my recommendation is you take a picture of yourself in the wig and you make notes about what it was that you liked and didn't like so that you can refer back to it later and you can use it to help you avoid making purchasing mistakes in the future. So density is something that will vary wig to wig. Permatease. What in the world is permatease? Permatease, okay, so at one point in history, women liked to back comb or wrap their hair to get volume in the crown. A lot of you know what I'm talking about. Permatease is used to sort of mimic that. 
So every wig is going to be um, have either some wigs will have no permatease at all. Some wigs will have tons of nesty pillowy permatease. You'll hear it being referred to like that. And then some wigs will have it somewhere in between. Uh, this one right here has quite a bit of nesty pillowy permatease on the sides and up here but it's not the heaviest I've ever had. Um, some wigs, when I do this, I can feel straight through to cap and I get no poo for permatease. Permatease serves multiple purposes. The first purpose is to hide the cap. So it's used to be, it's sewn in between the hair fibers and the cap so that you can't see the wefting and the tracks. That's one huge benefit. Another benefit is to give the wig volume because, you, you know, in or especially curly wigs need a little bit of permatease to help lift those curls off the cap. I, I notice when I like when I would go to work and I would be I'd have a wig on for 10 to 13 hours by the end of the day. The, if it didn't have a lot of permatease, it lost all its body and oomph. And even throughout the day, I felt like I had to constantly like be doing this and finger combing it because there was no permatease to help it hold the style and gravity and the heat of my head eventually made it sink. Even in a synthetic wig with curls, the body of it can sink and sort of mold into your head, even if the curls stay curly. With permatease, I noticed I didn't have that issue. This wig holds all of this body and oomph and style all day long because of the permatease. If she didn't have permatease, she'd start to look like my curls were falling at the end of the day. So permatease can have tremendous benefit. Your job is going to be to try to figure out where your sweet spot is with permatease and what your tolerance is. When I started, uh, Renee of Paris Kai is a very chin length, very straight, very flat bob. She has no permatease whatsoever. I wore that as one of my first wigs I wore to work. And it was one of the first ones I felt comfortable in and one of the first ones that I didn't think looked wiggy on me. Now, I can't wear Kai. She is way too flat for me. Just way too flat. I need some volume in my wigs. I didn't start there though, and that's my encouragement to you. Wherever you are today is perfect. Embrace your learning curve and know that you're gonna go through a learning curve. We all do. You are not the only one struggling. You are not the only one who can't seem to find the right wig for you. I promise. Um, I have been there and all of your wig sisters have been there. Know that you will evolve over time, so just figure out what what will help you get further in your journey. And there really are no substitutes to trying some different wigs. So I would recommend that you look at the return policy for anybody that you're gonna order a wig from. There are some really good online retailers with really good return policies out there. I know for a fact that Wig Studio One, as of the filming of this, policies change. Wig Studio One and wigs.com, both of them have no restocking fee. I believe Wig Studio One is a flat uh, shipping, like they, they basically, you can print a label from their website and I think then they take $10 off of your refund for the shipping. And I think wigs.com may take $7.95 or something. I personally, I would set aside a little bit of money if you at all can for those kinds of fees and chalk them up to your education. I say that my first 18 months is when I got my master's degree in wigs. I lost my mind, you guys. I spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm not kidding. We are not rich. I do not recommend you do what I do, but I'm here today because I did that and I learned so much and it really was an education I couldn't have gotten any other way. So if you can afford to buy a few wigs and be out 10 bucks in shipping here and there, then I really recommend you to buy some wigs and just start trying them and just get yourself used to different things and learn what works for you. You'll be surprised at how far you'll come with a little bit of experience. Okay. I think that's it. This is such a long video. If you're still here, God bless you. Um, but don't forget that I do have a companion document on my website and, um, so you can just refer back to whatever it is that you need the most help with. 
Well, this is my new wig wear series and like I said this is video one and I have probably five or six more videos to make so if this is helpful content for you please subscribe like this video leave me a comment just help support my channel any way you can this is such a passion for me and I just pray that I'll be able to continue to do this for you guys for as long as anybody wants to watch me so thank you for being here today and I cannot wait to talk to you guys soon